so Deb, Deb and I talked uh, a few months ago and she wanted me to talk about advanced statistics in SPSS, but as you can imagine, that universe is quite large. So I decided to focus on um, repeat, basic repeated measures um, because I probably do more of that than anything else for our uh, investigator-based or investigator-initiated research. So I'm, I'm gonna focus on that and show you a better way to analyze repeated measures data than, than, what, than I, what I normally see in the ancillary health sciences literature. But we'll start with, uh, I just wanted to remind you or um, for those of you who are new to this, uh, talk about the logic of um, repeated measures. So this is an independent samples t-test. I have two independent um, groups, <clears throat> say 100, 110 people in this group, 110 in this group. Um, there is no crossover of subjects between groups. This was actually for a dental hygiene um, exercise. So these people received no dental hygiene class. These people received a dental hygiene class. And I was interested in uh, looking at the efficacy of receiving this class. The outcome measure was number of average number of times teeth were brushed per week over six weeks. So I have a, a, a sample of the data. I was able to calculate means and standard deviations for both groups. And if you remember intro statistics, you remember the empirical rule, which tells us what a standard normal distribution looks like. 68% uh, of cases are included within one standard deviation of the mean, 95% within two, and almost everyone within three standard deviations. So just knowing the mean and standard deviation of these two groups of around 100 people, I can, I can approximate what the Assuming that these, this, uh, the sample, the samples represent are, are representative of the population and the, the population data are somewhat normally distributed, I can approximate what a normal distribution would look like in the population for these two groups. And I could apply the empirical rule back here to those distributions. <clears throat> of course, it's not real, but <clears throat> the point is, all I need to know right here is I know I need the standard deviation and the mean, and I'm, I'm good to go. So um, the mean is just a center. I can I can form a distribution around the the um, equation here. So um, we typically do not have population data. We have, we have sample data. And we are not interested right here, uh, we're really not interested in the differences between the population data because we don't have the population data. What we're interested in typically is the difference in means. Uh, the t-test um, evaluates the difference in means for the two groups relative to the background variation, the standard deviation. So given the um, mean and standard deviation and sample size, I can then form two normal equations which represent the location of the sample means relative to all possible sample means that I could have drawn from this population. And they would look like this. I have a mean of 9.5. Now the transition here is that I, in order to calculate the variability of the sample means rather than the raw data, I divide the standard deviation for my sample, divide, I divide it by the square root of n, and that gives me an index of variation for the two groups. And I, I need to pool these two into one term, but then once I derive that, that allows me to make an estimate of how likely it is that two samples from the same population 
have means as different as you see here. And what it comes down to basically is if the 95% confidence interval, which, which includes all the, which includes 95% of sample means drawn from a population with these characteristics. Uh, if the 95% confident, that would be 95% of all the data according to the, the empirical rule. So if the 95% if the confidence intervals for the no DH class do not overlap with the 95% confidence interval for the DH class, then I can claim statistical significance. That is, it would be highly unusual to um, <clears throat> select two samples that are this different if in fact they come, they came from the same population. So my, my conclusion ultimately would be that the DH class is effective. I've created a new population here that differs from the no DH class. So that's that's how we typically start talking about um, <clears throat> uh, statistical tests. The the the, the uh, independent samples t test is um, a nice way to. Um, introduce the notion of an inferential testing. So we're talking about repeated measures. So here's, uh, here are data, they're, they're not real data, but um, data which um, would represent a dependent samples or paired samples approach where I have a pre, I have measurements for all of my subjects prior to taking the, the dental hygiene class and then after taking the dental hygiene class. So this, the dependent samples approach to a t-test is somewhat simpler than uh, the independent samples approach because I focus not on the variation of the two distributions here, but rather I take a different score for each subject. I calculate the mean of differences down here and I calculate the standard deviation of the different scores. And then my index of variability here is simply the standard error of the difference in means is the standard deviation of the mean differences divided by the square root of the number of pairs. So it would look like this. If in fact the intervention made no difference, that is the post group was very similar to the pre group, what I would expect to see is that my different scores would be on average approximately zero. And I would have a 95% confidence interval around that based upon the standard error, the difference scores here. So what I found instead, and again, I, I made these data up. Um, so this is the distribution of the mean differences I would expect under the null hypothesis, i.e. the intervention was not effective. But in fact, if I uh, found something that looked like this, that on average, the mean difference was around five. Here, I look at my 95% confidence sort of all around the mean differences. And if it does, if the lower boundary here does not cross zero, then that would mean that zero, i.e. no difference is a very, is a highly unlikely outcome. So here I again would conclude uh, that the difference pre to post was, uh, statistically significant. And because I used a 95% confidence interval, I would claim a significance of less than P less than 0 0.05. And if anyone has any questions or you want me to repeat something, just jump in. I'd be glad to, to answer any questions. So then we make the jump to uh, something I very commonly see published, the uh, repeated measures ANOVA. So uh, repeated measures ANOVA, it, it, there are a lot more assumptions. I've just included some of the most important ones here, but it's, it's, you have to have interval or ratio data, i.e. continuous data. Um, the observations should be, in, uh, we use ANOVA when we have uh, interval or ratio data as an outcome and more than two groups, three, four, five, six, as many groups as we, as we form. Um, but in order to, in order that the repeated measures ANOVA be valid, the uh, observations must be independent and the variables must be, I, the repeated measurements must be um, identically distributed. 
So by independent, I mean, we're, we're obviously taking three or more measures per person, but the observations, that is the rows in our spreadsheet would have to be, you can't have one person serve um, as, uh, to, to count for more than one degree of freedom. So it would have to be uh, independent individuals with uh, multiple measurements on our outcome and those outcomes must be similarly distributed. You remember the homogeneity of variance assumption? That was, that's what this is getting at. Uh, um, IDD is what we typically just say here, independent and identically distributed. Or I'm sorry, IID. Um, so I, I guess I don't normally say that. So uh, we have a normality assumption that the test variables uh, not only must be um, normally distributed, come from a normal population distribution, but also when you plot one against the other in an n-dimensional space, the, the distribution, the multivariate distribution should be normally distributed in the population. Con compound symmetry means that the variances and covariance of the, uh, covariances of the repeated measures are identical. And I'll show you some follow-up on this. And sphericity, potentially, well, certainly one of the more important assumptions, essential assumptions, is that the variances of all different scores among the test variables must be equal in the population. And I'll, I'll show you that, what I mean by that. So here's our homogeneity of variance assumption, which we routinely test as uh, <clears throat> when doing a repeated measures ANOVA. Levine's test, the same as we use for regular ANOVA. And um, multivariate normality, if you can imagine, and this is a three-dimensional space, but uh, if we have five repeated measurements, you would have to try to imagine a five-dimensional space and if we could plot all of the variables, one against another, against another, and against another, we're assuming that they all would result in something that looked like this, three-dimensional multi, uh, multivariate normality, or five or six. The compound symmetry assumption, I said the covariances um, between all the measurements are equal. So we form a variance covariance matrix. If this, if this was uh, if five repeated measurements, all of the variances of our outcome score at each of the five times must be, sure. well, the assumption is that they are identical. Uh, the covariances, that is when I calculate, the covariance is, is kind of like a correlation coefficient but it hasn't been standardized. It's 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 um, it's the um, degree to which uh, one variable changes as another changes. But it hasn't been standardized by dividing by the standard deviation. So it's just a measure of dis of joint dispersion of two variables. And all of these under repeated measures assumptions should be identical, and these should all be identical. Uh, we test this using a routinely in an over using a boxes end test. Um, now sphericity is a little more complicated. Here I just this is an example of pre and post measurements. I don't remember what I was looking at here, but uh, and and then a third measurement at six months. So if I take the difference scores right here between pre and post, um, post minus pre and I take the different scores between pre and six months and then post and six months right here. These are all different scores. And I calculate the variance, the variability of these um, measurements. Repeated measurements ANOVA says these must all be equal. That, that is, I don't think I've ever run into a situation where that was the case but we routinely test it using something called Mochley's test. So um, the, the point being that um, 
it's very hard to meet the assumptions of a repeated measures of ANOVA, as you can imagine, just by looking at this. So to the degree to which you deviate from meeting the assumptions or fail to meet the assumptions um, <clears throat> can impair the quality of your analysis. So I'm going to move to SPSS. There are a number of things I want to show you in SPSS, show you how to do this. Um, can everyone see that uh, the spreadsheet for SPSS? Or can anyone see the spreadsheet for SPSS? I'm not looking at anyone's. Oh, okay, thanks, Tara. <laughs> I, I turned the video off. Okay, so what I've, I, I, I'm going back to this. I, in an earlier session, I was looking at uh, uh, forced expiratory volume, FEV uh, one, which is, this is the uh, volume that you're able to exhale in uh, liters per second. So this is a group of 600 odd kids uh, age three through I think 18 or thereabouts. And what I was interested in doing uh, in a regression analysis was seeing if I could um, predict FEV1 right here, the first FEV as a function of age, height, sex, and smoking. So here I've simulated two additional data sets, uh, FEV, FE2, and FEV3, which is this is to, I see a lot of data like this, but it, it's either a pre post or a follow up right here. And obviously, I, I, I could attack this by using multiple um, uh, paired t tests, but I couldn't do that in account for group assignment. Here, let me turn on the labels right here. So, in this case, I want to compare the progression, the change in FEV over time, uh, one through three, as a function of the active intervention group versus the control group to see if my intervention increased FEV. So uh, the first thing I would wanna do probably is look at the, as I've discussed in the past, I would wanna look at the data to just see what I had here. So what do the distributions look like? So I would bring these over, I'll, I'll, I'll run only the plots now. Um, and the normality tests, just to see what we have here. And obviously I've done this before, but what I'm showing here is that for FEV time one, I have violated the normality assumption for both tests, the uh, Kolmogorov, Shmirnov, and the Shapiro Wilkes. So I've got a problem there. The other two look pretty good. I, if this is less than 0 0.05, what it means is that the uh, distribution differs significantly from normal. So I can look at the histograms and I see why this is, they, why the tests tell me this is non-normal. It's quite skewed to the right. And uh, these are just different ways of representing that. But you can see I've got, if, if the data were perfectly normal, the dots would fall exactly on the line. But you can see at both ends of the line here, they, they, are, they represent skews or departures from normality, I should say, I guess. This is just a, a reconfigured enhanced version of that. And you see, I've still got problems on both ends. Box plot the same data, big problem on the upper end. Uh, this one is nice, pretty nicely normal. And you can see I don't have much going on here. This is for real data, for applied data, this is, this is about as good as it gets right here. And uh, got some problems on both ends though, some outliers. And then this is, this is the FEV distribution for time three. Um, looks pretty good. Looks about as good as you get with this size sample. It's about 600 people. That looks very good. And you're, the, the thing is, you know, you're, you're always going to get something like this or more accurately, something like this. Um, the data out here on, the, on either end are very sparse. 
So you're going to get, uh, it, it only takes one or two people out here to um, detract from the normality of the data. So, so this is to be expected. We just have had sampled either end of the distribution adequately, but that's okay. These are, these data look pretty good. That's what happens to you when you use a simulator to run them. Never happens in real life. So as I said, I could run a series of match pairs t tests, but that would not give me any sense of uh, what if my intervention worked. It would just tell me if they differed over time. So what I would fall back on, and what many people still fall back on, under the general linear model, you'll see an option to do repeated measures analysis of variance right here. So the way that you set this up, and, and tell me if you want me to slow down or you want me to repeat this. Uh, so I'm going to um, form a variable here. I'm going to call it time. It has three levels. And once I create, and I can create any number of variables here if I want to do a complicated analysis, but I'm going to limit it to one series of three measurements. And I'm going to define those as my outcomes at times one, two, and three. And obviously I want to know, does the progression of FEV differ uh, based upon group assignment? And routinely, if you're doing a study this complicated, you're also going to include some covariates, you know, because we know that FEV, I mean, it's well documented, obviously FEV, changes as a function of age and anatomy. So I'm going, to I'm going to include those as covariates to kind of capture some of the variants that I'd like to set aside to see if group has a unique effect on change in FEV. Now, uh, the ANOVA allows you to plot your data, which is very nice. And you can choose a line chart or a bar chart. I'm going to do a bar chart with error bars on it. With you can choose between 95% confidence interval. You'll you'll sometimes see these things published with uh, standard errors. Standard error is you know half the size of this, so it looks much like they've measured their data much more precisely. But the confidence interval is really the way to go if you want to publish the manuscript. So you can see here that I can. If I have a number of variables, a number of factors, I can create a lot of charts at one time. I'm just going to stick with one for the time being. So I've got my plot. I want to see the descriptive statistics right here. So I'm going to have it display the means um, and I'll have it compare the main effects. Although I'm not really interested in main effects, but just to show you that I can do that as part of this analysis. And I'm going to control here for um, multiple for multiple tests so that I um, am not um, optimistically estimating my uh, p-values. So this is going to penalize me for the fact that I'm doing multiple tests. And that's always a good thing to do. It's the more conservative approach. Uh, I want the descriptive statistics. I might as well get the effect size, um, homogeneity tests, I need those. And that's really all we need from here. And I want to do one other thing here. I, you can save into, you can save your residuals right here, which is very, very nice because then you can do some diagnostic work. Um, and I'm going to use the studentized residuals and I'll explain why they, they're very, they, these are all highly, highly correlated, but I'm going to, to save the studentized residuals to my spreadsheet right here. And there was one thing that I'm, let me check one thing here. Oh, parameter estimates. I want parameter estimates because it won't give them to you unless you select that. So now I think I can run the data and uh, I get a whole lot of output here. I'll start at the top. And it saves your code for you if you need it later. You can copy and paste that into a syntax window and replicate the analysis or change whatever parameters you want and replicate the analysis. So here are my descriptive statistics that I requested. And you can see that at time one, um, the two measurements across groups were very, very close together, which is what we would want. We want them to be as similar as possible at inception. 
and then they changed differentially at time two. The active got a little better than it increased a little more than the control, and at time three, uh, even more so. So the active this looks pretty promising. Now I've got my test for the covariance matrices, and it is less is greater than 0 0.05, so I'm good there. In fact, this is a very sensitive test, so we don't typically rely on a, a rule of um, 0 0.05. More typically, it's 0 0.001 because it's just an overly sensitive test. But I have met that assumption. I have equal covariances, so I'm good there. And then it gives us a, a lot of output. I'm going to skip down to the next block for the... Uh, uh, oh, okay, here's the um, test of sphericity. So you can, if, if this value is less than 0 0.05, I have not met the test for sphericity right here. And this index tells me how badly I missed right here. Well, these three indices actually, they're, they're differentially conservative. But I, I'm going to skip this one because those are, um, don't account. So the uh, index for time, this is a time by age interaction, time by height, time by group interaction. Those account, those don't control for other variables in the equation. I have to go down to this block. And then type, <clears throat> type three sum of squares means I'm controlling for other variables in the equation. So that's what I'm interested in. But what I'm really interested in is the time by group interaction. So the question that's answering is, uh, was, there, was there a differential progression of FEV dependent upon the group to which the um, subject was assigned? And you can see right here that I've got a very nice effect. So it tells me, yes, there was an interaction. There was a different effect based upon group assignment. Unfortunately, by default, it also tests these interactions, which I don't want because I only have age and height at inception. Now, if I had age and height for time two and time three, that would be a value. In this case, I don't want those. They just get in the way because you see that in calculating time by group, it's taking these out of my, it's penalizing me for, for, do, for these tests. And it's including, it's saying that time by group is statistically significant while controlling for time, while controlling for this interaction, while controlling for this interaction. So it's not a, it's not a, a great analysis. So right here, uh, the SPSS has noted that uh, I have violated my sphericity assumption. So what it does is try to correct it here. And it corrects it based upon the severity of the um, violation, these indices right here. Those, it looks at those and it penalizes me by, um, by changing the uh, degrees of freedom. You can see they differ for each test, so I'm penalized. Um, and I, I'm free to choose whichever one I want. Typically, th this is called the, win, the Winfelt correction is typically considered the best correction right here because it's quite conservative. It, uh, and it's, it's reasonably well accepted. You won't get any, uh, you won't have any problems if you use either the greenhouse guys or the wind felt, the lower bound is considered somewhat too conservative. This, uh, this is, you take the data as you get them, sphericity assumed, so it doesn't correct for any of these factors right here. So we, we would, given our much least test, as being significant, we would go with either the greenhouse geyser or the wind felt, and then we would report that in our results. Um, and then I've got a bunch of detailed data. Uh, my uh, homogeneity of variance test came out very nicely, so I'm pleased about that. And then um, these are my within subject effects. I also had it print out the, the partial edit square, the effect size, because most manuscripts, most publishers want the, the, uh, some indication, some measurement of effect size, and it's a very nice effect size. Um, I, I wanted to, to print this out because this, if you've, if you've looked at a regression, if you've looked at regression output, this will look very familiar. So when we're doing an ANOVA, 
a repeated measure ZANOVA, we're, we're basically doing a regression analysis. And this is in the um, language of a regression analysis output with our, our coefficients here. And our 95% um, confidence intervals for each of our variables. So this is the regression output for an ANOVA analysis. And then we have a lot of group comparisons here, which we're not really interested in. Uh, breaking out the um, data every which way. And then pairwise comparisons of time one versus time two, time one versus time three, et cetera. And um, and then our plot finally down here. <clears throat> and you can see here, um, this is repeated measures. This is a paired test. So you, you can only interpret overlap of the confidence intervals within group right here, not across groups. But no, that's not true. You can't do that either. Um, you, 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 you tend not to trust the overlapping confidence interval rule because we do repeated measures to um, calculate the standard error differently from how we would calculate an independent samples test. <clears throat> but this is, this is a nice graphic and shows you that um, at time two, uh, there was some effect for the treatment group and at time three, there was quite a substantial effect. But just in scrolling through these, what you're going to find is it really doesn't give me the, the ability to interpret the interaction that I'm after. And that's a limitation of repeated measures ANOVA. I can go back here and try every which way, and I have, um, to get it to give me that output. Uh, I can specify the model, but the, a big limitation of this is you cannot specify, you cannot build the interact, all the interactions you want in here. I cannot specify a time by group interaction, which is what I want here. I can't even do it under custom terms. So, um, so this is, uh, repeated measures ANOVA is somewhat limited in many respects. And I, I have not used one in years. I just don't like them. They're, they're very, they're very rigid, very inflexible, and you can't customize them to any degree. Uh, it's, it's, a nice, it's a nice, easy way to start looking at the data, but it's not something I would publish. So for, for a number of the reasons we've talked about, including the fact that we violated uh, a couple of assumptions here. Plus, you know, uh, the analysis depends upon the data being normal across all three time points, which they, they I have some concerns in looking at those histograms and looking at the indices. They're not, especially the first one was, was, not, was not normal. So I'm going to show you what I do now. This is a much more flexible approach. It's called, um, it's a generalized linear model for repeated measures. It's called a GEE, the, the repeated measures form of that is called a generalized estimating equation. Now, in order to do that, you can see here we have uh, data for 654 people, 654 rows. So we have measurements at time one, two, and three. So in order to do a general, use a generalized modeling approach, what we have to do is transform the data and it's very easy to do. So what we do is we go to restructure right here, the restructure command. And we can, um, oh, one thing I wanted to do here, um, there was a reason I wrote, these are the students, studentized residuals. I wanted to check, um, so I'm going to run box plots for a couple of these. So I, I wanted to look at my, my um, heteroskedasticity, you know, is the variance the same across different levels of the predictors? So if I take the FEV1, studentized residual, and I can run it by age, that's pretty clean. What I get is something that looks like this. 
and you can see I've also violated that assumption. These should all be somewhat ident somewhat similar. They're they're not. And again, um, you know, we have 600 people. Some of these are some of these categories are pretty sparsely rep represented. Like it looks like there aren't very many 17 year olds because we have a lot of variants there. Anyway, I, I wanted to show you this, and then I want to compare it to one that I run under uh, a proper model. So this is for FEV1. And you note also that I have, um, I have to look at three different box plots because I have my residual for measurement one, my residual for measurement two, and my residual for measurement three. None of them are very pretty in terms of, um, homoskedasticity, which is all of these things are equal. They're not. So going back to the restructuring, what I need to do in order to use the right model for this is I, I restructure the data. And you see I'm going from rows where all the data are within one row to stacking them right here. We call this the wide form versus the long form. And SPSS will do it, will convert it in this direction. It will also, if you have long data, it will convert it to wide data using the same command or the same initiate, you initiate the process using the same command. So what I want to do is I want to keep track of who's who. So I'm going to use this variable ID right here. I'm going to export it to my new file. I'm going to stack my uh, measurements of FEV right here. I'm going to call them FEV. So you can name your target variables and, and you, can, you can do as many, um, you can convert as many variables as you want. So this is not limited to just if I had measurements of weight or height or age across the three different periods, I could make four different uh, stacked variables right here. And I also want to bring over group age height, let's stick with that. And I'll, those are fixed variables. What, so what it's going to do is it's going to replicate those for every line of these. So I've got group, age, height, I think that's all I need. Yeah, I think so. And then it leads you through a progression of options. I only want one index, one, two, three, time one, two, three. And you can choose between sequential numbers or you could have it name them by the variable that it's using to, to um, to index that case. I'm going to stick with sequential numbers because it's easier to analyze than, than text. And then I'm going to have it drop everything I'm not everything else I'm not using. And then at this point I can finish. And I have rather than 600 lines of data, I have 1,962 lines of data. So you see for subject one, it has stacked um, the um, FEV measurements, one, two, three. And the first thing you do is you go in and change these names so they make sense. So this is really time is what I'm measuring here, one, two, three. And it always brings over the label for the first, uh, the first um, measurement, time one. So I'm gonna change that to FEV. So now I've got stack, a stacked or a long as opposed to wide data set. And then very, very importantly, do not save this because you see, this is a big problem. Um, <laughs> I would save it over my original data file. So I have to save as, and then I'm just going to call this GEE, I guess, generalized estimating equation. And now I can go back and forth if I, if I need to. So the way we approach this, the distributions are all fine. We've looked at that. Uh, so if you go down one additional step to generalize linear models, now this is a generalized linear models for uh, independent samples right here, but for uh, general linear models for repeated measurements, we have to use something called generalized estimating equations. And it's very simple to set up, but it takes a lot of attention to detail. So you have to tell it, um, th these, are, these are now, these would be called clustered data. They're the um, three measurements 
for each individual are correlated with one another. So in order to, to accurately calculate our standard error and our confidence interval and also our p-value, we need to take into account that these data we collected are clustered by ID and that they are within uh, subject data across three measurement points right here. So we need to notify SPS is that you need to form your correlation matrices based upon this information right here. And I won't go into detail about this, but uh, the data should be structured as uh, what we call auto. Here, the beauty of this is you can, you can rather than going with um, compound symmetry, which is required by uh, a repeated measures, no, but compound symmetry is this, exactly the same as exchangeable for some reason. But we can go with an AR1 correlation matrix. And what that means is that measurements that are more proximal to one another are stronger than measurements that are more distal to one another. So I'm going to specify just in the interest of time, I'm going to specify a working correlation matrix of autoregressive one because I know that that's what these that's how these data are structured because I made them that way. Uh, the type of model, we're going to go with a linear, um, given the, uh, some, the somewhat normal data. Uh, the response is going to be, as you would imagine, FEV right here. Now don't, uh, let's see. Okay, do I need anything? Okay, I don't need anything. So I want to use uh, group and time as my predictors, just like in the other one. So I'm interested again in the, the interaction between group and time. Do the groups change differentially across the three measurements? And I'm going to control again for age and height down here because I would need to do that anyway. Um, and then here, now here I can do anything I want. I can, uh, I can specify my model any way I want. And what I want is a group by time interaction because again, age and height didn't change over time. So I just tell it, give me an interaction term. So this is going to give me an analysis measuring the, the degree to which FEV changed over time uh, across groups while controlling for age and height right here, which is exactly what I wanna do. So I'm not going to change anything here. Here, I want to look at, I, I can have it print out my working correlation matrix and see how well it modeled my data. Um, and then I can have it give me all kinds of stuff here. I just move them over here and tell it, give me the means for all of these things. And um, I'm very interested in looking at the nature of my interaction. So I'm going to have it do a pairwise comparison for the group by time. For, so it's going to be for a three by two matrix. And I want to control for the fact that I'm doing multiple comparisons right here. And I'm going to export or I'm going to save um, my, my Pearson residual, which happens to be the same as the studentized residual I saved in the last, um, when we ran the repeated measures ANOVA, they're just named differently. I think I've got everything I want. Let me just check one more time. And you see, I've got my parameter estimates here, so I, I can interpret this as a regression approach, a re regression equation should be able to run that now. And I'll start at the top again, um, right here with my syntax. Uh, it gives me all the information about the input right here, how many with each value went in. Uh, it gives me, this is very important, a goodness of fit test. And just eyeballing that, this is, um, it's, it's, it's non there are no units, it's non-denominational, but the higher, the higher it is, the worse it is because it's a sum of all the, the errors in the model. It's the sum of your errors. So you want it to be low, it's, it's very, it appears to be very high, although it's all relative. 
So 1330 seems high to me. But here's what I want right here. And you interpret this interaction as being P less than 0 0.001. So I also see that age is important and height is important as you would expect and time obviously is important, but this is what I would write my results section around right here, the fact that we have an interaction. Here's my regression output right here with all of my coefficients, confidence intervals, p-values for each one of them. Uh, here's my correlation matrix, which I'm not happy with, but that's what it does is it looks at, it calculates the correlation matrix and it has, there's a trade-off. Uh, it's an algorithm, there's a trade-off um, that it needs to make in order to optimize the solution. And this, I would hope for higher correlations, but that's not the case here. So I didn't model, or I didn't uh, simulate my data very well. Uh, here's all, all of my descriptive statistics, active and control, uh, collapsed across time. Here are my time measurements. And then within control, one, two, three, active one, two, three, which I couldn't get from the other output from the repeated measures ANOVA. But here's what I like about this. So it gives me pairwise compares, every possible pairwise comparison. And so I here I can look group one, group zero time one versus, which is the control group, group zero time one versus group one time one, no difference. I can look at um, group zero time two versus group one time two, big difference. And I can look at group zero time three versus group one time three, right there, big difference. And I've got all the numbers I need to write it up and, and, and form a nice chart. Now, did I, did I save, um, yeah, I saved my Pearson here. So let's, let's look at this and we're running out of time. So let me, uh, let's see. Yeah, we've got enough time here. So let me show you this. So what I wanna do is the same thing I did the last time with my box plots. I want to um, plot my residual here against age and years. And it looks like that. So I, I, I noted I was not very happy with my, um, the fit of the model to the data. So what I would do next, or what I did next is I went back, opened this up again, and here you can choose your distribution. And you have, you have these, classic typical distributions, logistic, probit, uh, gamma, and you also can customize your distributions right here. You can combine them. It's called a Tweety, Tweety distribution, either with a log link or an identity link. So I'm going to go, because some of my data were, my distributions were somewhat skewed, I'm going to use a gamma link and I'm going to run that again. And I'm going to look at my goodness of fit up here. Uh, right here. So it went to, from around 1300 to 214. So I had it run my Pearson residuals again. So I'm going to do my box plots just to check to see how well I improved my goodness of fit. Whoops. Give me the same one. I need to choose the, the new Pearson. Um, so here's the one from the Gaussian distribution or the gamma distribution. And it looks like that. And um, they're, they're scaled differently. So let me show you, um, I did this earlier right here. So this gives you a sense of the power of this, of fitting your, your data with a, a more flexible approach. These are the box plots against age. These are all, this is error. We wanna minimize this to the, to the extent possible. So this is for time one, two, three. So these are scaled identically now. This is now from my generalized estimating equation um, <clears throat> with a linear link. Uh, that is, I didn't transform the data at all. And you can see it's, it's hard to compare, but if you can try to compare these, this one to these three, this one has much less error in the model. But when I use my gamma distribution link right here, you can see what happens. I've, 
I've optimized the model simply by uh, using a first a working a, a, a somewhat appropriate working correlation matrix. And here I've uh, modeled the distribution of the data much more realistically. So I've minimized my error with this model and this would be my final model. It's always good to check these things. So um, we're running out of time. Do you have any questions? And this thing, you know, it, it looks it looks easy because I've done this several thousand times, but um, you forget things and it's, um, the first time through is a little tough, but um, it's doable and it's not really very hard. Kurt, I have a question with, is there a situation where if choosing that transformation just kind of automatically and not really checking if it's, you know, a great fit or a poor fit, would that, if you just automatically do the gamma log link, is that going to cause a problem? You know, that's my default. But if you, leave, if you look at the histograms up front and you see a skew in any of them, I will, I always go with the linear first because that's the simplest and the easiest to write up. But my, my second choice is a, um, is the gamma distribution because it, it um, accommodates that skew. And you can see what, how much better the data fit with that, just accounting for the, the relatively slight skew. The working correlation matrix I always use when I have serial data, you know, because it almost always <coughs> is realistic for serial, sequentially collected data. So it, 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 it grabs some of the, it, it include it, it moves some of the error variance, the residual uh, out of your model or it, it accounts for it. So okay. those Thanks. are my, my go-tos. But then you always have the goodness of fit index. You can try any number of combinations and see which one minimizes the goodness of fit index. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Or any anyone anyone wants to talk about further? Thank you, Jay. Thanks, Janet. Yeah, I hope that made some sense to you. It, you know, I and I'm glad to I'm glad to help you with this stuff. It's um, it's tough the first time through, but uh, Tara and I've been through this several times, <laughs> and she's pretty good with this. She could do this by herself. And I even had to, well, because of time and COVID and being away, <laughs> being away from it, I had to actually, for the restructuring, I had a whole new data set that I had to do that restructuring. And that was what I forgot how to do. So I plugged away with it. And then I Zoom videoed myself, instructing myself how to do it. And I stuck that in the folder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I forget, a... because I don't do it so frequently. So, yeah. Yeah, that's repetition is is uh, is great if you can do it. But that's that's what I do. So if you need some help with this stuff, I I know, you know, without having to look up everything, how to do it pretty routinely anymore. So I'd be glad to help you with any any issues that arise, or make recommendations. Anything else anyone wants to talk about? So my, the, my bottom line is advice is, and I see a lot of these come across my desk, uh, repeated measures and over, don't use it. <laughs> you can do much better. And in fact, uh, if you send in the repeated measures and over to a good journal, they will probably send, I got a review back uh, from a, a faculty member I used to work with a couple of weeks ago who'd done a repeated measures and they said, <clears throat> GE, Unfortunately, it's ordinal data, so it's a tougher way to go. Uh, ordered logistic regression, which is doable, but a lot more difficult than what we did today. But it's it's highly doable. Anything else? Well, thank you all for coming. Well, thank you, Dr. Bay. Yeah. Thanks, Kurt. Uh -huh. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Kurt. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.